A feeling of panic was starting to set in around southern Louisiana in January of 1862. Two months earlier, the Confederate Navy's river defense fleet tried, unsuccessfully, to break the Union blockade in the Mississippi River Delta, and was now waiting for the other shoe to drop. Confederate military leadership knew it was only a matter of time before the Federals moved up the Mississippi River and invaded Louisiana. At the time, the SS Arizona was a civilian vessel ferrying passengers and freight on the Mississippi River and the Gulf Coast. It was owned by the Southern Steamship Company and named in honor of the territorial movement in the Gadsden Purchase Lands. Then, on January 15, 1862, while the steamboat was stopped in New Orleans, Confederate General Mansfield Lavelle had the steamship seized for the war effort. The steamship was converted into a blockade runner, and three months later, the CSS Arizona was on its way to Cuba. In Havana, it would receive fake credentials from the British consulate, and from there, run the Union blockade under the false name of the Caroline. Although the CSS Arizona's name would mostly be a secret, the Arizona Territory in 1862 was represented in the armed forces, with units in the Confederate Army, and now with a steamship working for the Confederate Navy. In part two of this film, we looked at the December 1861 arrest of the fugitive California State Assemblyman Dan Showalter. The rebel sympathizer and a group of 15 other armed men hoping to escape to Confederate Arizona were caught and arrested in San Diego County by men of the 1st California Cavalry. Given that the 15 men traveling with the infamous fugitive were from El Monte, a publicly known hotbed of Confederate sympathizers, and because of the direction in which they were traveling, and armed with several weeks worth of ammo and provisions, the Federal soldiers knew exactly what these men aimed to do. Some primary sources in the official records claim that some of the men in the party were already commissioned Confederate officers and not just prospective recruits. Also, since the group assembled at El Monte, a suburb of Los Angeles and a pro-Confederate haven to rival Mariposa County, there's a strong chance at least a few of them were members of the now disbanded Los Angeles Mounted Rifles or the smaller offshoot militia, the Monte Mounted Rifles. Either way, the rebel sympathizers were locked up and their goods confiscated. Four months later, in April 1862, Showalter was released from the military prison at Fort Yuma and compelled to take the oath of allegiance to the Union. Upon his release, instead of going back to California as he was told, the ex-assemblyman went south to Mexico and spent months making his way east through Sonora and Chihuahua to get to Texas. A year later, Showalter would be a commissioned officer in the Confederate Army's Arizona Brigade. Around the same time that the Showalter party was captured by California volunteer soldiers in rural San Diego, reinforcements for Colonel John R. Baylor's 2nd Texas Mounted Rifles and Arizona Rangers were on their way from the east. Confederate Brigadier General Henry Hopkins Sibley arrived at Fort Bliss with roughly 2,500 men. Unbeknownst to the rebels, the California Column was already planning to push them out of the territory, but its progress was painfully slow and methodical. In another stroke of luck for the Confederates, the Colorado River flooded, temporarily turning Fort Yuma into an island and delaying the Federal advance. This bought the Sibley Brigade time to make it to Mesilla, capital of the Arizona Territory. On December 20th, 1861, just days after the Sibley Brigade's advance guard had crossed the Rio Grande, Sibley issued a proclamation from Fort Bliss claiming the New Mexico Territory for the Confederate States, and promising the New Mexico population that their persons and property would be respected, and that his troops were coming as friends and would buy all needed provisions on the market. All of these assurances coded a thinly veiled warning for the population to stay in their lane and not make themselves enemies of the Confederate Army. Sibley arrived in Mesilla in January 1862. As the ranking military officer in the Mesilla Valley, Sibley absorbed Baylor's battalion of Texas and Arizona troops into his own forces, but he allowed Baylor to remain as military governor of the Arizona Territory. General Sibley called his newly beefed up brigade the Army of New Mexico. On February 7th, Sibley's Army of New Mexico headed north along the Rio Grande and crossed the 34th parallel to occupy the territory for which the army was named. While Baylor's troops had pushed the Federals out of the Arizona Territory, 
New Mexico proper, that being New Mexico north of the 34th parallel, was crawling with Union soldiers. Colonel Edward R.S. Canby had four regiments of federal regulars, two infantry and two cavalry, and so far they'd evaded all of Baylor's attempts to isolate and capture them. In addition to the regulars holding out at Fort Craig, the New Mexico Territorial Government raised five regiments of volunteer infantry and two regiments of territorial militia. Among the Union commanders was the famous frontiersman, Colonel Kit Carson, who commanded the 1st New Mexico Volunteer Infantry. Longtime Indian fighter, Colonel Miguel Pino, was at the head of the 2nd Volunteer Infantry Regiment. New Mexico Assemblyman and former Sheriff Jose Gallegos, commanding the 3rd Volunteer Infantry, and the Sheriff of Albuquerque, Sheriff Armijo, commanding the 1st Regiment of New Mexico Militia, while former Mexican soldier Nicolás Pino headed the 2nd Regiment of Militia. To reinforce the federal regulars at Fort Craig and the scattered New Mexico volunteers, Colonel John Slow arrived with the 1st Colorado Volunteer Infantry Regiment, known as the Pikes Peakers. Three guesses where they were from. While Colonel Slow was a lawyer in Denver, the majority of volunteers in the 1st Colorado Infantry were miners and mountain men who had made the arduous journey to California for that earlier gold rush, and knew how to survive in the harsh elements. The 1st Colorado left Pikes Peak in February, starting a forced march at night and marching through a blizzard through the night as they made their way down from the Rocky Mountains. They then crossed over the Raton Pass, through the deserts and mountains of northern New Mexico, arriving at Fort Craig after marching 500 miles in just 10 days. These Colorado volunteers would play a key role in New Mexico's resistance to the Confederate invasion. By February 13th, the Confederates were within 15 miles of Fort Craig, so they hunkered down in the desert and waited for three days. Canby set up a defensive line south of Fort Craig. The Federals skirmished with the Rebels, but Sibley called off the frontal attack and fell back. At this point, the Rebels were down to their last few days worth of rations and dangerously low on water. At a council of war on the 18th, Sibley and his officers agreed they'd attack the garrison at Fort Craig, take the fort, and live off the Yankees' rations and supplies. On the morning of February 21st, General Sibley sent an advance party to Valverde Ford, where the Rio Grande was low enough to cross, just five miles north of Fort Craig. Colonel Canby's scouts tracked this movement, so Canby deployed a mixed contingent of infantry, cavalry, and artillery to head the rebels off. When companies from the 2nd and 4th Texas Mounted Rifles arrived near the eastern banks of the river, they found the Federal Advance Guard waiting for them, denying them access to the river. That meant the rebels could not get water for their canteens and horses. The battle started off as an artillery duel, but both sides were out of each other's range, so the initial barrages were ineffective. Reinforcements from the 4th Texas arrived and gave the Confederates the numerical advantage, but Federal reinforcements from the fort were on their way. General Sibley was drunk and spent the morning in an ambulance. At noon, he relinquished command to Colonel Thomas Green of the 5th Texas Mounted Rifles. At 2 p.m., Green ordered Company B of the 5th Texas, the Lancer Company, to make a cavalry charge at the Union extreme right flank. When the Lancers charged toward the river at the Federals, they thought they were attacking an inexperienced company of New Mexico volunteers. Instead, the Rebels came up against a company of Pikes Peakers, and the Colorado volunteers poured gunfire into the Lancers and repulsed the charge. The only Lancer charge of the American Civil War failed. When the remaining Lancers made it back to the Rebel lines, they dismounted, ditched the hog pokers, and rearmed themselves with pistols and shotguns to continue the fight as infantry. By late afternoon, the Federals had the advantage on the field. However, Canby did not want to make a frontal assault on the Confederate center, so he opted for the Rebels' weak left flank. Canby redeployed one of his artillery batteries closer to the enemy's left and brought troops out of reserve from the West Bank to the east, including Kit Carson and the 1st New Mexico Infantry. Colonel Green wanted to stall the Federal attack on his left, so he sent infantry to charge the Union's right flank again, this time on foot and away from the Pikes Peakers. This attack was met by heavy gunfire by the 1st New Mexico. Kit Carson then led his troops in a flanking movement that poured enfilading fire into the attackers from two directions, thus repulsing that charge. Canby sent reinforcements to bolster his right flank while continuing to press towards the enemy's left. 
This left the federal center weak and exposed, and Green pounced on the opportunity. 750 Confederate soldiers charged at the federal center in three waves. The first wave forced the Federals to fight hand-to-hand -hand with the Rebels. The second wave made the Federals start to retreat. The third wave turned the Federal retreat into a rout, with the Confederates taking the field and both sides of the river at Valverde Ford. The Confederates lost 36 men killed in action and 150 men wounded, while the Federals lost 68 killed, 160 wounded, and over 200 desertions from the New Mexico Volunteers. One of the Union soldiers killed at Valverde was Lieutenant George Bascom, the young officer whose attempt to capture Cochise the year before had united the Apache Diné in a war to expel all foreign invaders from Apacheria. Canby ceded the field to the rebels, but his defeated force hightailed it back to the safety of Fort Craig. That made the Confederate victory at Valverde completely hollow, since it failed to dislodge the Federal garrison from the fort. If the rebels couldn't take Fort Craig, they couldn't eat, and they would have to move on further into New Mexico with the Federal garrison at their backs. Indeed, the Confederates were half-starved when they entered Albuquerque on March 2nd. When the Federal garrison bugged out from Santa Fe, 60 miles northeast of Albuquerque, many of the army wives stayed behind, including Louisa Canby, wife of the commander of Fort Craig. When the Confederates arrived in Santa Fe, they were literally greeted by a welcoming committee of Federal Army wives acting very hospitably and no doubt as passive-aggressive as possible. Sibley declared martial law in Santa Fe and sent the women home. The combined force of rebel troops from Texas and Arizona again met Federal regulars backed up by New Mexico and Colorado volunteers seven miles southwest of Glorieta Pass. The first day's fighting broke out in Apache Canyon. Both sides tried an initial frontal attack, but both sides were also driven back by each other's artillery. Major Charles Pyron of the 2nd Texas Mounted Rifles fell back with his 300 Texas and Arizona men one and a half miles deeper into the canyon and set up a defensive line. However, Major John Chivington, commanding New Mexico and Colorado Volunteers, split his force in two and flanked the rebels, driving the 5th and 7th Texas Mounted Rifles from Apache Canyon. However, the 2nd Texas stubbornly held their ground. That was when the Pikes Peakers, mounted on horseback, made an unbelievable downhill cavalry charge that crashed into the Texans with a hell-bent fury and total disregard for personal safety. One Texas soldier remembered, they were regular demons in the shape of Pikes Peakers. On they came, but nothing like lead and iron seemed to stop them, for we were pouring it into them from every side like hail in a storm. How some of these men who charged us ever escaped death will ever be a wonder to me. With the Colorado men's cavalry charge backed up by a push from the regulars and the New Mexico volunteers, the last Confederate resistance crumbled and fell back. However, the Federals knew they couldn't hold the position, and they also fell back to the safety of Pigeon Ranch. Some sources say that one of the reasons why the Rebels had such a hard time keeping it together when they were under so much pressure is because a couple of hundred Texas soldiers actually didn't speak English. They spoke German or Spanish. On the second day, there was no fighting, but neither army had left the battlefield. Both sides spent that time regrouping with reinforcements, resupplying, picking up their wounded, and digging foxholes in their positions for the next day's fighting. On March 28th, the Confederate Army of New Mexico drove the Federals back from Pigeon's Ranch and from Glorieta Pass altogether. However, scouts from the 2nd New Mexico Infantry found something they could hardly believe. The Confederate supply train for the entire brigade, more than 70 loaded up wagons, were only lightly guarded at Johnson's Ranch. This is because the Texas troops had left behind a company of German immigrants with orders to guard the supply train. However, the general consensus among the German Confederates was that they did not sign up to guard mules and wagons, and so they headed off toward the sound of the cannons to win their share in the glory. Meanwhile, Colonel Manuel Chavez sent a dispatch to Major Chivington, who still had charge of the Colorado Volunteers, informing him of the new intel. Within hours, 500 Pikes Peakers descended on the supply train, routed the guards, and burned the rebels' wagons.
This lightning attack behind enemy lines made the Confederate expedition to New Mexico completely unsustainable. Another Confederate battlefield victory became pointless, with the loss of men and provisions the rebels could not afford to replace. Sibley and his officers knew they'd have to go back to Texas or starve, so the brigade fell back to Santa Fe. When the rebels retreated from Glorieta Pass, they hadn't evacuated all of their wounded, and many of their casualties were bleeding to death on the desert sand or freezing to death in the cold high desert night. When the Confederates hobbled back into Santa Fe from their Pyrrhic victory at the pass, Louisa Canby was horrified. She sprang into action, mobilizing dozens of Anglo and Mexican women of Santa Fe for a mission of mercy. Many of these women were army wives, but all of them were bearing the burden of an enemy occupation. Nonetheless, in a stunning act of compassion, these women collected food and cloth for bandages, and they traveled the 20 miles to the pass in order to treat and evacuate the wounded Confederates. For her leadership role in this act of mercy, Confederate veterans of the New Mexico campaign remembered Louisa Canby as the angel of Glorietta Pass. After they had picked Santa Fe clean, the Confederates retreated to Albuquerque. On April 8th, Federal artillery started blasting the Confederate positions at Albuquerque for two days. However, the Confederates shrewdly used the civilian population as human shields. Late in the day on April 9th, a local civilian ran out to Colonel Canby's command post, begging him to stop because the Confederates were not allowing the civilians to take shelter from the bombardment. And so Canby ordered a halt to the barrage. Three days later, the Confederates abandoned the city and headed farther south. Joining them on the retreat was New Mexico's Attorney General Spruce Baird, a rebel sympathizer who openly collaborated with Sibley's troops during their invasion of his territory, and who might have been thinking while on the march to Mesilla that he'd bet on the wrong horse in this race. The following year, Baird would be a commissioned officer in the Arizona Brigade. Five days later on April 14th, Canby's federal troops captured a supply train headed for Sibley's brigade. Canby learned where the supplies were headed, so he sent Major Chivington with Colorado and New Mexico volunteers to surround the village of Peralta, where a column of the 5th Texas was resting and waiting for the supplies that were no longer on their way. The Federals pounded at the Texans with artillery, and the rebels took cover behind the many adobe walls. As the Federals pressed the village, they captured 22 Confederates. However, a massive desert dust storm blew in, eliminating all visibility and ending the artillery duel. The rebels used this dust storm to sneak past the Federals and escape to the west bank of the Rio Grande. In this artillery duel, one Federal soldier and at least four Confederates were killed, while the village of Peralta was reduced to rubble. The Confederate Army of New Mexico was in shambles when the first columns arrived in Mesilla, battered and starved. Seeing the writing on the wall, that the Yankees were coming, County Judge J. Peter Deus, a late addition to Arizona's Confederate government, adjourned the Doña Ana County Court until June in consideration of the disturbed condition of the county. His words, the Confederates had won every battle, but they had lost New Mexico, and they were about to lose Arizona as well. As the Colorado and New Mexico volunteers were helping the regulars push Sibley's army out of New Mexico from the north, the California volunteers were preparing to roll back the Confederacy's borders from the west. At Fort Yuma, one of the Teamsters tending to the Federal Army livestock was Haji Ali, the genial camel herder from Syria who'd crossed the American desert with the U.S. Army Camel Corps in 1857. In the spring of 1862, he was still working for the Army, herding camels as long-range beasts of burden. And this special Army civilian participated in the California Column's march into Arizona. From Fort Yuma, Colonel James Henry Carlton had sent messengers to various Unionists in Arizona in order to get food and supplies ready to sustain the Union march to push the Confederates all the way back to Texas. One of the men tasked with fulfilling a large order was the merchant Amai White, who had a mill and trading post in Casablanca, near the Odam villages. White had stockpiled over 1,500 bags of flour and other needed provisions like horse feed for the California troops. In a rare tactical blunder for an otherwise thorough and methodical man, Colonel Carlton sent a small detachment of only 10 men from the 1st California Cavalry 
led by his personal friend Major Charles McCleave, to go to White's Mill and check on the progress of the order. McCleave then split up his group even further and went all the way to White's Mill with only three other cavalrymen to back him. McCleave arrived at White's house long after midnight. When he knocked on the door, a man in civilian clothes greeted him and let the Federals inside the house. Once inside, after a few minutes of conversation, the phony mill workers drew revolvers on the four Federals. The man pretending to be Ami White was actually Captain Sherrod Hunter, and the phony mill workers were Arizona cavalrymen. The real White was under arrest and under guard nearby. Hunter had spies in the Odom villages that informed him of the Union collaborator, and Hunter arrested him and waited for McCleave to arrive. Once the four Federals were captured, Hunter sent a squad of men led by Lieutenant Jack Swilling to take White, McCleave, and the other three Federals to Messiah. The rebels then gave the 1,500 bags of flour to the Odem people as a goodwill gesture. Throughout the week, several detachments of Arizona Rangers were busy burning various supply caches near the villages that the Federals from California were depending on to feed their army and animals. On March 29, 1862, a small contingent of Arizona cavalrymen, most of them former militiamen from the Arizona Guards, absorbed into Baylor's Arizona Rangers, were burning the hay stores for the Union Army livestock at Stanwick Station, an abandoned stagecoach stop, when the squad of rebels was spotted by a scouting patrol from the California Column. The rebel squad saw the approaching Federal patrol and they held their ground. In the very short firefight that ensued, one Yankee private who happened to be a German immigrant was wounded by the rebel gunfire, and the Federal patrol pulled back to the safety of the 250-man advance guard column. As the advance guard for the California Column appeared on the horizon, and the rebels saw they were outnumbered 27 to 1, they got the hell out of Stanwick Station. News of that skirmish in western Arizona caused the San Francisco Evening Bulletin to comment, The Secesh are bringing the war pretty close to home. Now, some sources claim Jack Swilling was a squad leader at Stanwick Station, but he was not. He was taking prisoners to Mesilla at the time. On April 15th, other contingents from the California Column engaged the rebels at Picasso Pass. Under the red, rocky Picasso Peak, a patrol of 13 California cavalrymen, with Tucson Unionist John W. Jones as their guide, shot it out with 10 Arizona Rebel cavalrymen. Contrary to what we often see in reenactments and some documentaries, only a few soldiers in the Army of New Mexico had uniforms, and they were mostly officers. The rest of the men either wore civilian clothes or captured Federal uniforms. Three Federals were killed in the skirmish, including Lieutenant James Barrett, and three more Federals were wounded, so the Union soldiers fell back from the battlefield for the safety of the column. It was another tactical victory for the Rebels, but at a dear price they could not afford. Three Rebels were captured in the skirmish, including squad leader Sergeant Henry Holmes, and two more were wounded. These were five casualties that the small Tucson garrison couldn't afford, since they already had less than 100 guys. Although they were the last ones standing at Picasso Pass, the seven Confederate survivors retreated to Tucson. The Confederacy had completely lost its bridge to Southern California. To add to the list of setbacks for the rebels in Arizona, on May 5th, an army patrol from the garrison at Tucson was ambushed in the Dragoon Mountains. A war party of 100 Chiricahua and White Mountain Apache guerrillas, led by Chiefs Cochise and Francisco, hit the rebel soldiers at Dragoon Springs, killing three soldiers and a Mexican Arizonan Teamster. The raiders also took the livestock that the Teamster had been handling. Four days later, a foraging squad of Arizona Rangers counter-ambushed the Apaches, killing five of them, and the foragers took back the stolen livestock. That second battle of Dragoon Springs was the last time Apache warriors fought Confederate troops, although the indigenous Diné saw no difference between white invaders dressed in blue and white invaders in gray. Captain Sherrod Hunter knew he could not hold out against both the Apaches and the Yankees, so the Arizona Rangers prepared to abandon Tucson, the very town where the Arizona Territory was founded just two years earlier. The rebels had won most of the battles they fought against the Apache, and they usually inflicted more casualties on the natives than they received. Despite that, the Apache nation clearly won the Apache-Confederate conflict 
since they succeeded in depopulating most of the western and central parts of the territory, turning Tucson into a lone outpost. Obviously, the advancing Federal Army had a lot to do with the Confederate retreat and also the civilian exodus, but the Apaches fought many more battles against the rebels in Arizona than the Federals did. By mid-1862, the Apache Nation, united by Cochise, controlled most of Apacheria south of the Gila River. Their luck against the Federal Army would be very different and tragic, but that's another story. The approaching California column caught the Confederate rear guard at Tucson completely by surprise. The Arizona troops expected the Federals to approach from the west. Instead, the Yankees hooked around the north side and approached the town from the north and east. Tucson fell on May 20th, 1862, without a shot fired, with the last Confederate soldiers escaping the city's south side only minutes before Company B of the 1st California Infantry marched into the town. Over 40 prominent secessionists were promptly arrested. One such detainee was Arizona Militia Colonel Palatine Robinson, who had served as Adjutant General in the provisional government that seceded from the Union. Another was Mark Aldrich, a former Whig who had served in the Illinois legislature with Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln years earlier, but who had chaired Arizona's secession convention in 1861. After the arrests came the fines. Under U.S. martial law, at least one merchant in Tucson was fined for refusing to take money from the Union Army as an act of protest in favor of the CSA. Now that the Apaches had driven the Confederates from western Arizona, they turned their attention to the Federals, whose renewed presence in Apacheria was just as unwelcome to the Diné. In mid-July, Apache reconnaissance spotted around 150 Federals, mostly infantry, drawing water at Dragoon Springs. The Diné correctly predicted that the Bluecoats' next stop would be the springs at Apache Canyon. On July 15th, the California troops were ambushed in Apache Canyon by 200 Chiricahua and Membreño guerrillas led by Cochise and Mangas Coloradas, with Geronimo also participating. The Apaches were prepared. They were stocked up on rifles and ammo, and they'd built stone breastworks on the high ground. This allowed them to withstand the cannons firing at them from down below in a barrage that lasted well into the night. The guerrillas abandoned the battlefield sometime after midnight on the 16th, content to fight another day. Their offensive did not deter the Federals from holding the area around Tucson or from pushing eastward. The last bastion of Confederates holding out in Arizona was Mesilla, and the mangled army of New Mexico was already getting ready to retreat from that city. After their Pyrrhic victory at Gloria to Pass, the Confederates had arrived in Mesilla destitute, broken, and on the retreat. The pro-Confederate probate clerk for Doña Ana County, Charles Hoppin, made the last entry in the court records from Confederate Arizona. It announced that Judge John Peter Deus had resigned and that the district court in Mesilla would be adjourned until September. That session did not happen. The only court sessions that happened for the rest of 1862 were courts martial. Knowing the tide had turned against the rebellion, the local Mexican population did not want to sell their goods to the rebel soldiers for Confederate money that they knew would soon be worthless, nor did they want to incur the wrath of the oncoming Union Army. So, the rebels replenished what goods they could by just taking them from the local population at gunpoint. These predations against the largely Spanish-speaking population of the Mesilla Valley caused a lot of the Hispanic soldiers in the Confederate forces to desert. One Mexican resident of Mesilla wrote while the retreating army still occupied the city, the people here are with their eyes open toward the north, in the hope of being relieved of these locusts. More than 1,000 men are waiting with open arms to receive the liberal government of the north. In this context, liberal government meant a democratic republic with free commerce, not the martial law and forced requisitions that they'd known under Confederate Army administration. The Texans in the army were brutal on Mexican Arizonans who resisted, but many of the Anglo-Arizonan soldiers who'd started out as settlers, who had years of good relations with their Mexican neighbors, did what they could to put the Texans' behavior in check as the rebel army disintegrated. Lieutenant Jack Swilling, formerly a miner and Arizona guardsman from Pinos Altos, personally intervened and stopped Texas troops from taking livestock from locals in a small village north of Mesilla. Colonel William Steele of the 7th Texas Cavalry Regiment 
was the ranking officer in Arizona while General Sibley was roaring drunk, then sent for Lieutenant Swilling to report to him and explain himself. The gold miner and citizen soldier knew he was being punished for doing what he believed was morally right. So rather than be made an example of as a mutineer, Swilling simply deserted from the service. Swilling took off along with nine other Arizonans who'd enlisted for military service specifically in Arizona and had no intention of going to Texas with the Confederate Army. On July 1st, a foraging party from Baylor's old battalion, the 2nd Texas Mounted Rifles, was on rear guard duty in the Mesilla Valley, looking desperately for beef to forcibly requisition from the local population. A group of local Mexican-Americans noticed the roving band of soldiers, took up their guns, and attacked the Confederates, killing seven of them and with only one escaping alive. Some sources claim as many as 40 Mexican Arizonans died fighting Confederate troops in this guerrilla action. This was recorded as the Second Battle of Mesilla, although at the same time, other stragglers of the nearby 7th Texas Cavalry were also harassed with hit-and-run attacks by Mexican Arizonans until they were out of the territory. Three days later, on July 4th, the Federal Army reached the edge of New Mexico, where the west bank of the Rio Grande looks into Texas. That was Texas's official border on the map, but in between the outpost border town of El Paso and where the state's population actually lived was 500 miles of Comanche raiding zone. Texas troops had occupied Fort Bliss in modern-day El Paso in the spring of 1861, but in July of 1862, the collapsing Sibley Brigade abandoned the fort and it too was occupied by the California soldiers. The Confederacy's western border was pushed back to San Antonio, and Texas was now flanked by federal troops on its east and west borders. Confederate Arizona had fallen. This concludes part three of this film. However, the story is not over yet. In part four of this film, we'll look at Arizona's territorial government and military units in exile as well as plans to take back Arizona at the very end of the Civil War. And of course, lots of coverage of the Arizona Brigade in combat. Thank you for watching The Civil War, Wild West Edition.